Well, welcome everybody. This is a tradition uh, that uh, I'm not sure where the idea of wisdom of the elders came from, but I know they do it at NERFA every year. I know they do it at the uh, Sunny Oaks, of course. And uh, so we've done it at the National, we've done it at the NERFA, we've done it all, in all different places. And for me, it's just, I think, one of the most essential things about what Folk Alliance is all about, which is learning from the people who have done this for many, many, many years. And these folks, if you combine their, their years of experience, would be frightening, quite frankly. <laughs> So we don't, want to, we don't want to do any numbers. My name is Matt Watroba. Uh, not only am I a, a radio host, but I'm also a, a performer. And uh, I really was honored to be the person to moderate this because I, I do know and love every single one of these days. And, that, uh, and they have impacted me like they have impacted so many other musicians. So I think I can speak for a lot of musicians about what these folks have done and, uh, and, and sort of you know, speak for all. And I think the way we're going to do this, because we have about an hour and 15 minutes, is we're going to spend about 15 minutes per Dave. And then we're going to, if there's time at the end of all that, we'll open it up for any kinds of questions that you might have for any, any one of these guys. And this is a great panel because it really does encompass a large span of the kind of work that we do in the world of folk music. We have uh, presenters and performers and managers, and, and I think there's a, there's a lot here. And I'm, I don't know why I feel, feel repelled, uh, compelled to start with, uh, with Dave Siglin down there on my left and your right. Um, Dave, do you mind going first? Do you mind going first? Okay. <laughs> I had a feeling you'd say that. Um, I'm going to save a lot of what I have to say about Dave uh, and Linda, his wife, uh, for the, the awards show. As you know, they're getting the Lifetime Achievement Award tonight. But, but, uh, but for the purpose of wisdom of the Daves, you know, for those of you who may not know, uh, Dave and Linda Siglin started uh, managing the ARC. They took it on as a temporary job to get themselves through theater school, basically and then 40 years later retired from doing it. Uh, Linda, of course, had to t take on other jobs, uh, but of course, so which only meant she worked twice as hard because she was doing that and, and that, uh, which is why she is here as well. But for the wisdom of the days, we're gonna talk about the ins and outs of keeping the tradition of a music club like the Ark, which started out as basically a weekend club with a hootenanny on Wednesday nights, but it was mainly a Friday, Saturday thing. Uh, very often in the early days, they would hire one performer for the whole weekend, which is something they don't really do anymore in, in the folk music world. Um, and then it, of course, has blossomed into a six or seven night a week venue in the heart of you know Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, and it's become an amazing presence, and it always has been. But it always it all started with this kind of vision of of Dave and Linda Siglin. And so I thought, David, maybe what we could talk about is uh, how, how it came to be and what you learned uh, from doing it. Go. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> how did it came to well, the ARC started out in 1965, and uh, the first manager was George Abbott White, and he hated folk music. So he didn't do any folk music. But, but SDS had their meetings there. So it was, it was very political, which was really cool. And... Uh, and then, two other managers came and went, and then Jim and M. Fiker came, and I was working at Herb Davids, and Jim Fiker came in. They ran it for a year and a half, and they said, we're looking for a new manager. So I thought, well, I'll put my hat in the ring. I had, uh, and so they interviewed me, and they met Linda and interviewed her, and they liked Linda a lot, so they hired me. <laughs> and, um, they said, we're getting two people for one salary which was $400 a month for 10 months, so it was like, sort of one salary, but free rent. And uh, what I've learned? Yeah, well, just talk about, you know, what, what, when people come up to you and say, what have you learned about running a club? What, were the, <laughs> what, can, <laughs> what can we learn from you, David? <laughs> well, should you start by talking about your philosophy about booking Acts for the well, when we, one started of out, when we started out, my first thought was they have to be as good as me. Well, that lasted a couple of weeks. And uh, 
and I woke up and said, well, they have to be better than me. And, and then we realized we have to learn something from these people when they're coming through. And that was a huge step forward. And, and actually, in May of 69, we came there in the mid-fall of 68. In May of 69, Michael Cooney was playing, and Pete Seeger, um, Don McLean, Andy Wallace, John Everhart, Mike Rivers, and Louis Killen were in Flint doing a benefit uh, for the swoop, I think, or for something. And Don and Pete didn't come, but in the middle of the second set of Michael, all these other people came storming in, and so he called a King's X, is what he called it, and that meant, you know, take a break. And they all got on stage together, and they went all night long. And uh, sea shanties, ballads, etc., etc. And Barry O'Neill was up there with them, Barry O'Neill. And, uh, and you should look up his web page, by the way, anybody who doesn't know him. The guy is fantastic. And, uh, and Luke Hillen told this story, um, oh God, okay. Renner died. He told the story, and then he sang the song, which was four verses long, and it was unbelievable. And I remember Jack Quine, who was a performer, jumping around in the back of the room, going, this is where it's at, this is where it's at. And right then, we changed to doing traditional music. Boom, completely. Traditional and grassroots music, and that changed the direction of the art that night. And, uh, and we didn't hire singer-songwriters, except for local ones, until the Canterbury House, which was a competitive club in town, which did pop folk until they went out of business. And then we brought Jack Elliott and Tom Rush and people like that over. Dave Van Ronk. Tom Rush, not for years, but Dave Van Ronk. And uh, what, kind, what kind of impact did this have on the community back then, Dave? I mean, what, there was a community building up around the arc. songwriters over? Or? No, no, the whole thing. Once the songwriters came, once the arc really started to get a reputation, how did that change that little area of Ann Arbor, do you think, in terms of music? Well, I mean, we were asking the performers not who could play the art, but who should play the art. And that's a huge difference. I mean, if you run a club and there's a performer you really like and you say, well, who should play here? They're going to give you really good names. And uh, there was, I mean, you could, there was just an avid audience. I mean, you know, they would come week after week after week. And they built up slowly. Michael said, uh, Billy Vanover. Sarah Gray and uh, Ray Burrell, and then they came and they said who they thought should play it. So you booked based on what other performers were recommending? I didn't know them. Right. And, and the interesting thing, because I grew up around there, was that hardly anybody who came to the Ark knew who these people were. But they came to trust yours and Linda's taste, which was based on, of course, the taste of the people who you were booking. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and eventually, I began to develop these from listening to all these people. And, uh, and eventually I was getting a hundred demo tapes a month. Unsolicited demo tapes. And I... Uh, this is back when they were chiseled onto stone. So <laughs> really and I would listen to all of them. And when I retired, I was still getting a hundred a month and listening to all of them. And, uh, and I think Anya still gets them. Well, let me speak for uh, as someone who um, really was nurtured as a performer through what the work you did. And that is, I think I counted up 18 opening acts that I did for you, uh, for Tom Paxton and Don and Arlo Guthrie. I mean, you invested in me as a local performer, and it changed my whole life. And, and I just wondered, we don't see many opening acts anymore. Another life ruined. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't see that that kind of place where young people can learn how to do this anymore. You know, that I, I, I was given Tom Paxton's audience to learn, and you did that not just for me, but for dozens of local performers, which I think had an amazing ripple effect. But So what, what, what was your um, sort of philosophy about opening acts? <laughs> Funny you should ask. I have a particular philosophy of opening acts that I, that I suddenly hit upon about 25 years before I retired. And uh, I think, you know, if you, if you open for something, the audience doesn't even want to hear you. You're at a minus 10. And you have to be incredible to get up to zero. And it struck me, nobody paid to see this opening act. They could be great, but nobody paid to see them. And it 
really hit me the night that Dar Williams opened for Ani DeFranco. And it was Ani DeFranco's first time at the art, and, and Dar's first time at the art. And uh, it struck me, if the main act introduces the opening act, you know, if they know them, they know their music, if they come on stage and say, you're going to really like Dar Williams, I love her music, blah, 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 the audience is automatically going to start her at zero instead of minus 10. I think that's a huge jump in somebody's career if somebody does that for them. And uh, Ani, by the way, wouldn't do it. But, <laughs> but everybody else I asked did it. And, uh, you know, if they knew them. And, and I also learned when I was making announcements that nobody wanted to hear me. I mean, I was making these announcements and just blah, 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 you know. And one night I was making announcements and I thought, I don't think anybody's paying attention to what I'm saying. They're just waiting for so-and-so to get back on stage. So the next time I introduced, had to do an opening thing. I said that uh, Gamble Rogers is coming next week. He's a uh, petty thief. He flies and he bicycles backwards. And then I just kept on going. And there was not a blink in the eye. And that was the last time I made announcements. <laughs> then, I would ask the performer to pick out people that they liked who were up and coming, who were coming up to the art in the next couple, and talk about them. And they did. <coughs> and that helped build the audience a lot right there. Absolutely. So, you know, let's fast forward a little bit. So you have this club and it's going on the weekends. You're nurturing a lot of the local performers through the Hootenannies is what you used to call them open stages, open mics, whatever we call them today. And then all of a sudden, um, it got to another level. All of a sudden, we, um, we, we, first of all, needed to move out of that beautiful old building that, uh, that the church was helping with, and we needed to open a new ark. How, did you, how were you able to keep the ark going through that amazing transition? Drugs. Drugs? <laughs> Do you recommend any particular ones? Or <laughs> well, Art one at that point was, I mean, you could run it in your sleep. It was doing what it was doing and it was doing it well. And uh, so moving to art two was a real challenge. Yeah. And that, you know, because first of all, it was more expensive to do. And uh, I think my salary the last year at art one was 11,000 bucks. So I demanded 25 the next year at the new place. And they gave it to me. And I thought, and that's, and I thought, that could sink it. And uh, so I went out and I raised the money um, to do it. I started a corporation that owned a piano and did this and that. And people invested in it. And then we paid the investors back over the course of several years. Uh, and it kept going. And to be honest, what actually made it was getting a club liquor license. And, but, but talk uh, about your philosophy behind that, though. It's not like. It's not like a bar. Business? No, it's not a bar. Uh, you have to be a member to purchase a drink. And, and we figured this out from uh, Second City in Chicago. <coughs> the bar is not in the room with the performer. It's in a separate room. You can get a drink, you can take it, and you can sit there and you watch the music. We had all the chairs. In the first arc, there were cushions on the floor surrounding the performer. In the second, all the chairs faced the stage. There was not a single chair facing away from the stage. <coughs> And even when there were tables, you'd have a chair facing there, a chair facing there, and two chairs here facing there. So you, you were at a show, you were not at a bar listening, you know, talking and, hey, don't sing so loud, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And, and um, to this day, that's true. I mean, yes, the new very true. Yeah. In fact, the night we opened, somebody had convinced us that we needed to have food. So, what did we know about food? I mean, we had always served popcorn and donuts and stuff. So we had... Jim Ringer and Mary McCaslin were playing, and somebody was in the front row eating some crunchies, whatever it was, <laughs> that we were selling. And it just drove Mary nuts. And Jim said, I didn't even notice. <laughs> it <was> just like, <laughs> <laughs> so that killed that. And we, we realized what kind of food you could actually yes. sell. Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> Something soft and silent. <laughs> um, we only have about five more minutes. I could do this all day, and, and in fact have with you. But um, another thing that I've always admired about what you and Linda did was it wasn't just about hiring an act 
that was already known, that you knew would you know, fill the seats, but you would find someone who you thought worthy of that, and you would cultivate an audience for them. You would, you would take yeah. chances on them. You would lose money on them. And then they would very often become. Yes, we would. And then, but then they would very often become the ones who came back and did the benefits. Yeah. Um, yes, and I'll finish off the opening act thing because of that. The other thing about opening acts is I think if you're an opening act, you should play 15 minutes. And I know they say 45 minutes. Go ahead. You know, blah blah blah. No audience wants to see an opening act for 45 minutes or even a half hour. 15 minutes, you can do three songs and you can be perfect. And that's why a lot of people who play open stages do better than professionals when they're opening for people. Because they know they can do three songs, they know what three songs are going to do, and the audience will like you a great deal more than if you play eight songs and uh, kind of fall apart in the center of it and then kind of get back up there at the end of it. You know, Three songs, get off the stage to thunderous applause and, uh, and tell them if they want to see you more, have the club manager hire you and bring you back. And, uh, and so would you cultivate audiences for those folks who did that? Sure. And, yeah. and how would that work? How would you do it? Well, I mean, we actually had a folk festival going on in January to raise money for the Ark, and I would put unknowns in the festival who I thought could walk out in the Hill Auditorium or the Power Center or wherever it was and galvanize the audience. And, uh, and that worked almost every time. Yes. Uh, there's a couple of people that it didn't work with, and it killed their careers. Uh, two people, specifically. I won't mention their names. Uh, and they were very good musicians, but they just, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, right. like going on too long or starting off terribly. Yeah. And uh, but for most people, it really built their audience. So the Shamil sisters I saw singing on Ashley Street, uh, just singing on the street corner, and I said, wow, you know, and I had them open for the persuasions. And people really liked them. And we put them in the folk festival, opening the folk festival, and kaboom. They played the art then, and then they played the power center. And they just, their career just went, you know, because they were really good. Well, I'm, I'm going to say my, my, all my praise for you tonight when I introduce you and whenever we're doing the awards. Is that tonight? Yes. Tonight. Um, <laughs> but I do want to say on behalf of everyone who passed through that place, uh, what a magical, wonderful place it was. I even hesitate to use the word magical because there was no magic involved. It was you and Linda doing hard work, learning, and passing the All right, Dave, you're next. <laughs> Seated to Dave Siglin's right is Mr. David Barrett, who uh, is not only an award-winning performer, composer. Uh, he, he just, he has, in my opinion, uh, really mastered the idea of what it is to own what you do, own your creative work, and then to, and I'll, I'll use the word exploit in the very best way, but to use it in a way that can, you know, really make a career for yourself. And he has a real sensible way of making music, his, and, and, and selling his music, and one of the things, and, and I guess I could say one of his shining moments might be the fact that he wrote this little song called One Shining Moment. And I know he wrote this song uh, at a bar he was playing up north in Michigan, uh, you know, kind of like after the gig. Is, am I getting that right? And, uh, you know, kind of just started writing this thing, which would, of course, change the whole course of his life because the NCAA basketball tournament decided they wanted to use that as the theme. They do a montage at the end of every... Uh, Fab Four tournament, and David's song, One Shining Moment, has been sung by some of the greatest singers in, in the world, uh, Jennifer Hudson and so many other great singers, and, uh, and really has become a kind of a cottage industry and has allowed Dave to, to kind of take, that, take off on that and compose music for films and compose music for commercials and compose unbelievably beautiful singer-songwriter records as well. So I, I'm really glad Dave, David Barrett is part of the wisdom of the Daves. So Dave, how'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was simple. <laughs> I would say, uh, I, I always tell a story. <clears throat> I was in Nashville writing songs, 
which was a disaster uh, because I didn't write songs that Nashville liked. And I had an epiphany. I was in the manager of Garth Brooks, I can't remember his name, and I wrote a, a real weeper, and I was so proud of it. <laughs> And uh, that time they had a cassette, so it was called When I See Her Children. And it, uh, I won't bore you with the whole song, but it goes, When I see her children, it makes me wonder why they look just like their mother and like that other guy. <laughs> and, and it goes on, and it's weeping and weeping. So, any event, about uh, 30 seconds into it, he pushes stop and says, well, What were their names? Excuse me? Their names, the children. I want to know. If you're going to sell songs in Nashville, you have, to, you've got to know their names. So I left. And he tried to come. And, and never went back. And I thought, well, I need to write exactly what I've been thinking and feeling of, instead of trying to please these people. And it was the best thing I ever did because three weeks later I wrote One Shining Moment and CBS picked it up. And, um, and then all of a sudden I had talent. Who <laughs> <laughs> <And>, knew? <laughs> because then I had talent, they began to hire me to do all sorts of themes because <clears throat> of the song. And so consequently I was writing Olympic themes, or themes for the golf, or tennis, or whatever. And as a result of that, I realized I had a tiger by the tail, in the sense that they, these were playing weekly, and, and one shining moment for the NCAA uh, Final Four business. So I kept all my rights as a publisher, and I was a sole writer. But you say that like it's no big deal, but the truth is, when you write a song that gets that much attention that quickly, there are people who would like to buy those rights from you. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. The more it became this, my little version of American Pie, it, it sort of grew from this little sprig to a mighty oak. And I had numerous offers. Um, but then Tempting? Then, Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. I'm glad I held on to them. Um, all of them. So all these themes, all this work and stuff, um, I, I own all the rights, including one China Moon. And, uh, and so, in fact, when Luther Vandross sang it, they are playing over my tracks. So I own all that except for Luther's voice. Um, so. It gets into, then I took some courses up in Crooley Law School in intellectual property. I thought, well, uh, well, I'll back start. Uh, someone came up to me the other day and said, how did you become a good guitarist? And I said, well, uh, no one liked my songs. So I just kept practicing. <laughs> and then, anyway, you know, I, and so I figured, well, no publisher at that point, I understood what I was doing, so I would self-publish. And then I learned a lot of intellectual property law because no one else was doing it. And so consequently, I sort of fashioned this broader arc of what I do. I, for some strange reason, I had an affinity towards it. Um, and then I, there's an anecdote because I was I would go to New York and meet with all the uh, fancy pants guys, and it was intimidating. And but then I learned the power of a copyright because I'd be in these in these expensive suit type of situations, and they would go on and on on what they were going to do, and, blah, blah, blah. and then finally I said, "Well, what do you think, Dave?" Well, I own it, and that's a powerful thing. <coughs> Because I own the copyright, yeah. so you're going to have to ask me uh, what to do with it. And, and so I always encourage to respect your work enough, because you don't know um, 
you don't know how it's going to find its way into the world, what you do as a writer. And that's, that's just respecting what you do. And the great thing about this country is that copyright actually still matters if you, you're careful. And it, it's not fun because it's real left brain that I don't enjoy doing either. But, boy, well, I'll tell you, it, it, it made all the difference because these copyrights were in motion and then all of a sudden for the brief, you know, I was about 10, 12 years where I was really talented. And those things kept, I, I was out on tour, in this case with Art Carfunkel, and then I would go home and then watch the golf there, and I had 80% of the music on golf. And I, I didn't write music for golf, but all of a sudden I had talent, so they thought so. So as a consequence, I was, you know, I'd written all these instrumentals uh, before, because I liked playing the guitar. So I would convert those into the songs, with them, and they would approve them. So it was doing many things, and because I owned the master, and I owned the copyright, then they'd have to pay on both sides of the pie. So, and that was only because I went to this, these law courses, trying to figure out how this gets done. It's not that hard, if I can do it, you can do it. And it's worth doing, and I would recommend to anybody, there's a book by Randy Poe, P-O-E, uh, called Music Publishing. And you don't have to, no case law to... It's not 600 pages either, it's no. a nice little thing. That, yep. Yeah. And it, if you're going to do this, read that book, because it, it really helped me immensely. Can you repeat that? Sure. It's uh, Randy Poe, P-O-E, and it's called Music Publishing. You can get it at Amazon. And it sort of walks you through um, some of the perfunctories. You know, one other thing, David, I'd like to just bring up, uh, because you do have a, you know, you're a humble and a good man, uh, but I think some of the work you do has so, there's so much to learn from what you've learned. And one of the, one of the things I'd like you to just talk briefly about is, and one of the things I admire about you, is when someone comes up to you knowing you're a songwriter and they say, hey, you're a songwriter, could you write a song in this style? Um, what David says, no matter what, it is, is yes, because I'm a songwriter, and songwriters write songs. And I think the songwriters in this audience might benefit from knowing why you always say yes. Um, well, a mortgage, but... <laughs> but we all have those. Yeah. No, actually it's true, because um, after I had talent, then I got all these offers to like, um, score films. Well, I've never scored. But when this person called and said, I've got this film and I want you to score it for PBS, I said, yes. Because um, in all those gigs playing, you know, I did the college circuit too, and you're in the middle of wherever, and I get up in the middle, uh, or I get up and go to the park and play guitar, because I just like playing the guitar. So anyway, I thought, well, I can write music, and I can write melodies, and so I faked my way through the first one, uh, and it went, I didn't scare the horses. So uh, they asked me to do another one, and another one, and pretty soon other people are asking. And so then I became, you know, writing scores for films, because then I started to get the angles of how the um, architecture goes for those things. And because I'm a, a guitarist too, I could do, um, finger style guitar, so I can look at film like the old 30s films and play to the actual film, which gave it real advantage. Um, and so it seemed to work. And then I it must was, be hard to watch a movie with you, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone said, Well, uh, okay, I've got a children's show. And can you write children's songs? Well, I have two daughters, so I was writing songs all the time for them just because they were entertained by my songs, and that was a great audience with my two kids. So all of a sudden, I was writing for a PBS show um, and enjoyed the heck out of it, because then it takes you to a different place. You know, a lot of times singer-songwriters, and I, I write that all the time, there's a, a belief that if you're, not, if you're not writing something that's authentic or serious or whatever, 
I like Woody Guthrie's uh, car song, you know. <laughs> you know, he, he was having fun. Yeah. He was goofy. And so I have no reservations about writing a foot in that song. One last thing, and that is when you call David Barrett's phone number, which I'll give to everybody, <laughs> uh, it, he answers it this way. Good friends music. Good friends is a philosophy for you, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And what is that philosophy? Well, it's like a, um, I have a, a, a confederacy of, of fellow travelers, and um, I love it when they, they, when they become talented, because then they hire me to be the guitarist. <laughs> and then when you have, you know, a gig like when CBS comes in, then they have, you know, so then they would pay uptown rates, and I'd have all my friends. And you sort of get a feel for who does what, you know, where's their sweet spot as a, a player or a writer or wherever. And so it's just this sort of loose confederacy of friends, and it's good friends. And uh, we watch our children grow together and go to each other's weddings and, and manage not to stop being good friends. Well, if you're wondering why we included David Barrett here today, that's exactly why. How about that? Okay, Dave is next. <laughs> uh, I, I must confess, I, I do know and love Dave Humphreys. I don't know him as well because he's not one of my Michiganders. He is, in fact, one of those, what do they call people from Illinois? Illinoisians? <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Illinois. Illinois. Illinoisans. Illinois. 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 <laughs> Um, but, I, but I am very much uh, aware of the work he's done in this small, beautiful little community called Downers Grove, Illinois, just outside of Chicago, where for, uh, <laughs> where for only, uh, what, four decades, every single Friday night, there's this little place underneath this church in Downers Grove called the Two-Way Street Coffee House, which... I think standing room only is about, what, 60 people, Dave? Something like that? Yeah, 65. 65. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just this consistent, beautiful, traditional place where people can, can play for a listening audience where they know they will get respect. And again, you, you want to call that magical, but it's not magical because there's, there is a trickster behind all this who uh, knew what he was doing and learned as he went. And, and I'm really curious, and I'm sure this audience would be too, Dave, Humphreys is to, what did you learn along the way making sure that this tradition of the two-way street coffee house survived? Wow, that's a big one. <laughs> um, first of all, let me explain that I no longer run the two-way street. Uh, they fired me. <laughs> I don't think that's the one. Actually, no. Uh, <laughs> retirement for me was not an event. It was a process because uh, I simply decided that the two-way street was a bit magical, and I was hoping that it might outlast me. And so I wanted that transition to happen as a, uh, as a plan, rather than an emergency situation someday. And so that's the reason we did that, and it's been very successful. There are 35 wonderful people running the two-way street comedy right now, and it's doing beautifully. I learned along the way? Well, um, I probably ought to mention first how it kind of happened. And uh, I, this is not going to be sequential, but uh, I was uh, sitting in the Rock Hall in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, about somewhere near the end of the last century. Uh, and uh, Pete Seeger had been invited there to give a uh, a talking interview with Bob Santelli, who was the running the Rock Hall, or at least the education part of the Rock Hall at that time. Folk Alliance was meeting in Cleveland that year, and that was the excuse to bring Pete Seeger up on the stage of the Rock Hall. And he gave an incredibly wonderful interview, uh, followed by some songs. And at that point, his voice wasn't real good, but his, his grandson uh, was there to help him out and uh, fill in the gaps and so forth. But after it was all over, and it was a very wonderful experience, Pete came over and sat on the, on the edge of the stage 
and was just chatting with people. And I walked over uh, and said, uh, well, I was going to say something to him, and he looked over and he said, hi, Dave. <laughs> Which caught me a little back because, yes, I have met Pete Seeger, but Pete Seeger meets thousands of people, and it sort of surprised me a little bit. But, but at any rate, uh, he said, how's it going? And I said, well, let me tell you a story about uh, 1960 something, early 60s, when I was a student at Oberlin College, you came and gave a concert at Oberlin. It was in the middle of winter, there was a snowstorm, you always traveled by Greyhound bus. Greyhound buses were behind schedule because of the snow, and the, there was an audience of almost 2,000 people waiting to see you for like an hour. Finally the bus arrived and you walked across the, the couple of blocks from the, the station, escorted, but there was no way to drive it, so they walked it. You walked out onto the stage, kicked the snow off your boots, uh, opened up your guitar case and your banjo case and pulled out underwear and socks <laughs> and gave a concert that changed my life. And uh, I, after that concert, we had a jam session and I was a bass player at that time and I was playing bass with Pete Seeger and that was part of the life-changing experience. I also hung out at a coffee house in that town called the Co-op and they had folk singers and that was pretty life-changing for me, too, because when I went back to Downers Grove, Illinois, sort of close into Chicago, part of the Chicago mega megapolis, megapolis, I guess, uh, there was nothing like that. There were some colleges and some music venues and so forth, but nothing in that venue for songwriters or traditional musicians or whatever. And I said, i got to fix that somehow. And it took me a couple of years, but I was connected with the church in Downers Grove, the First Congregational United Church of Christ, and uh, with the pastors and the people who run the place and so forth, and I was a little bit involved in the youth program, and they were talking about maybe opening a youth drop-in center. This was uh, during the Vietnam era. There were a lot of uh, unsettled kids uh, around on the streets. When I say kids, I'm talking really late teens, young adults. And they wanted to do something to support these, these kids, not just draw them in, but actually support them. And, and my mind started moving and I said, we got to have music there. And this was a hook to get us started. And we opened the two-way street in uh, 1970. It was a drop-in center, kind of, but it had music every time it was open. Uh, we had professional volunteers, I should say, I guess, uh, volunteer professionals on the staff that provide some services to the kids, too, legal, financial, uh, sometimes residential assistance, and medical, and stuff like that. We had the police chief and the mayor and other people on our, uh, on our side on all of this. So, um, but we had music, started out being music from some of the kids themselves. And then as the word got around, we got some other people starting to come in. Well, the short answer, I guess, is that, that over the first five or six years, we established a need for this social service aspect of the two-way street, and other agencies popped up to uh, fill those needs, but the music persisted. And people kept coming to hear the music. And 48 years later, they still do. And it's in the same room of the same building, of the same town. It's been painted a couple of times. <laughs> Clean. Clean. Yes. It's right downtown. It's across the street from the public library. It's a block from the commuter rail station, uh, surrounded by restaurants and bars and stuff like that. So uh, that's a little bit about what it is. What did I learn, I guess, is how to treat people. I learned a lot about how to treat and interact with people. What kind of people am I talking about? Artists. You treat artists well, and they will perform for you well. Um, you know, you guys all know what that means, I think. But you'd uh, agree with that, Dave Sibley, right? No. Because I know that's how the art is. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, you treat artists like they're human beings. You know, um, I remember when I first met Mike Caesar. Linda didn't even know who he was, because she came from a theater background. I was so uptight 
because this was Mike Seeger. And after he performed, he said, we're sitting in the room, and he said, I'm hungry. And Linda went, well, there's some food in the refrigerator and peanut butter and blah, blah, blah. Go help yourself. And he went, huh? She says, yeah, well, there's peanut butter and some salami and stuff in the refrigerator. Go help yourself. They became great friends because she just treated him like he was a normal person. Exactly. And a lot of the performers, well, in the early days, they were local people. But you treat them like they're important. They're an artist, and there's value in art. And you take care of their needs, even though we were just a little place in a church basement with a green room that was cluttered with children's toys and stuff like that. But uh, there's another group called uh, Audience. These are people who are there to be entertained or to support the musician or to support you. They're there for complex reasons, but they're people and human beings too, and they're partners, along with the artists, along with you. And so you, you treat them like customers, but also like friends, and that makes a big, uh, a big deal for a place like that. There's a third group it's called volunteers. Mm -hmm. Treat them like gold. <laughs> <laughs> you treat volunteers well, and they will do down near anything for you. And I've seen that over 48 years. Uh, we've never had a paid staff at the Two Way Street, so uh, if it weren't for literally hundreds or maybe by now thousands of volunteers over the years that wouldn't have, have survived. So, so that's, that is, a, I think, a major thing. If you treat people well, they will respond. Did you have any particular philosophies about how you worked it? Did you keep a percentage of local and traveling musicians and that kind of thing? Well, initially, initially we were a small classic style coffee house, meaning these are you open the door and people come in, they don't pay much. And they may sit and listen to a couple of songs and make it up and walk out. You know, it's a little bit of a come and go. It wasn't a concert series. We initially were booking local people and um, we weren't either charging enough at the door or paying enough to get, we thought, people who weren't local. And we had a pretty good pool of, of local talent. Um, after a while, the word kind of got around, and some people from out of town, further into Chicago, other towns and so forth, would, would be calling us up. We were a little taken aback initially. You, know, you want to come here to play for, well, I won't say how much, but in the early days it was two digits. Um, that was almost 50 years ago. But, the, 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 the real thing that happened, though, is we did develop a community of artists around the Chicago area, and I started learning that as they traveled and spoke about the two-way street, there were two things that happened. First of all, the word of the two-way street got spread around the Midwest and eventually around the country. But the other thing that happened is a lot of the people these artists talked to said, well, I played at the two-way street, and people would say, well, what's that? We learned that, and, and about concurrent with that, as some of the word started spreading, we started getting inquiries from far away. Well, we initially sort of said, well, we really can't afford you. We're not that big a budget kind of operation. And they said, well, maybe you can. And what they were saying is they would like to get a foot in the door in the Chicago market, perhaps. And we also learned that by bringing in some of these touring artists, a relatively small percentage initially, they would talk more about the two-way street other places and we would learn that when our Chicago artists went traveling and wanted to find gigs in other towns and they said, I played the two-way street, somebody would say, oh yeah, <laughs> instead of, what's that? So it was, pardon me, <coughs> a two-way street. <laughs> um, Initially, it was about a 2080s situation. We booked mostly local still. But over the years, those percentages went up. And it's 50-50 or so at this point, and maybe even a little higher, because you know we've been in one place for 48 years, and people around the, the country would like to come to Chicago and play, and even though we don't pay a whole lot. We pay more than some places do. We're not a tip jar place. <laughs> 
And there are some surprising people that we have met at Folk Alliance conferences and so forth that uh, um, we've, uh, they've come and performed and packed the place and uh, the word has kind of gotten around and so on. So the booking philosophy evolved over time. You know, I booked other places and I had booking philosophies for them. It was pretty it's a very unique kind of situation in that regard. I should mention too that Dave Humphreys, beyond the two-way street, does all kinds of work with music and community and volunteering. Can you just talk a little bit us a little bit about the other things you have your your hands into as a retired person? Oh, as a retired person. <laughs> no, throughout your life. Nobody knows how to retire, you know, it's just the way it is. Well, I paid my way through college playing a bass. <laughs> Stand up bass, and then I learned electric bass, and then I learned to, uh, and, you know, whatever worked. And uh, so I was on that side of the of the lights for for a while. Um, still did that for quite a while. Although then I started producing more, not just the two way street, but some other things. There were some some regional and regional festivals around the United States and Canada and so forth that I got into. It wasn't all folk music, folks. Please don't kick me out of the building. <laughs> But uh, I did I did some of that for uh, you know for money. Uh, I've done some coaching. I've done some a little bit of booking in other environments. My love has always been folk music because I tr I truly believe that folk people are, are the most cooperative, the most helpful, the most fun people to work with. You didn't just say that the, at the heavy metal convention last <laughs> week. <to> say, <laughs> heavy metal people are the but the folk people don't always pay the mortgage as yes. well as, <laughs> as, as uh, the, the, the rock stars, so to speak. But, uh, but so, uh, yeah, I do some of that. I also um, have done quite a lot of volunteer work over the years. I did have a career for a while selling giant computers to corporate America for IBM. But uh, I left that fairly early in my lifetime in order to do the stuff I, I loved, although I loved that too, but it also paid me enough to afford to do some of what I'm doing later. Um, but um, I do volunteer work in the community. I'm very active in our local governmental thing, various committees and, and uh, commissions and things of that sort, social service activities. Uh, I've done a lot of work in uh, mental health uh, areas. I founded a mental health uh, function in the DuPage County that I live in now that eventually got me appointed to the DuPage County Board of Health and I, I did that for a time as a layperson. Uh, I'm a trustee of a public library. I, uh, Didn't you have something to do with football? <laughs> well, 30 years ago I did. 30 years ago, yeah, I, I was one of the founding members of, of Folk Alliance, the North American Folk Music and Dance Alliance. And uh, the name has been changed, and I approve of that name change. <laughs> but uh, over the years, uh, you know, I was invited to run for the board of directors, which I did, and hoped I didn't win, but I did. <laughs> and I spent eight years on the board of directors, and I spent two years as president of the wonderful clients. Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> It was at a time when Folk Alliance was going through some philosophical stress about are we an educational preservationist organization or are we a business organization? And thank goodness the answer came back finally, we're both. We're both. Well, one thing I think if there's a thread through the, three, the first three days uh, is that sort of that word we all know and love, which is community. I mean, community is around every single bit of the work these three folks have done. Uh, and, and, and really, Dave, that's what you are all about. So thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, that is a lovely place to play music, folks. If you get a chance to either play there or hear music at the Two Way Street, it's in good hands. It's a lovely, lovely little room. And uh, thanks for that, too. And they let me come back once in a while and sit in the audience. <laughs> well, speaking of community, we got one Dave left. I love this man. This man has done so much for folk music. 
in so many ways that it's, I mean, just to tick off, not just, just the idea that he is a great performer, songwriter, has managed to keep a, a group together, a folk music group called Mustard's Retreat, for, uh, they started, what well, you guys started in 1932, right? <laughs> 74, I was close. <laughs> Beyond that, you know, if you know a little bit about the history of commercial folk music, you know that, you know, it was kind of like in the 1950s, all of a sudden it became popular in the late 1950s, and, and the Kingston Trio, and, and the Peter, Paul, and Mary, and the Greenwich folk scene, and all that, for a brief period, you know, Wayne Newton put out a folk album. Everybody was kind of getting on the folk music train. And that lasted, well, what did, what did uh, Utah call that? Do you remember? It was, I think, the great folk scare of the early success. <laughs> But soon after that, it, it kind of went away. It never goes away, of course, ever, because that's one of the things that sets folk music away from other types of music. If the venues close, we do it in our houses, right? We're doing that right now. We don't let it disappear ever. But in the 1970s, that kind of was the songwriters, the, the John Primes and the Joni Mitchells and these folks who, James Taylor, who were keeping the music alive as singer-songwriters. Which, which changed the whole idea of what the original folk boom was, which was singing these old traditional songs to college students mainly, right? Um, and then in the 1980s and in the 1990s, uh, the singer-songwriter thing really started to, to take over. And one of the things, I can talk about Dave and what he's done as a manager, what he's done as a booker, what he's done as a musician, but what a lot of people don't know about, about David Tamulevich is how he was there to, I think, in many ways, kind of bring folk music out of the ashes of the 1970s into the 1980s, and really carved out what many of us know now as the folk circuit that we all play. So, is that accurate? A little bit? A little bit. Okay. <laughs> the other thing all four of these guys share is a humbleness about their work. So, uh, none of them are comfortable hearing me sing these crazies. But David Tanyulevich, you're welcome to talk about anything you want, but I thought maybe you could start by just letting us know, uh, you know, maybe commenting on what I just said about what was going on at folk music at the time you sort of decided to get involved. Yeah, I, I um, had been doing music full time, and uh, I wanted to be a dad, you know, and I wanted to be there and be a dad. You know, my, um, this morning in the management um, plan workshop, we were talking about that, how your plans shift. And I was looking for, for something else to do to keep me at, at home, and um, I, became, I became an agent. And um, I had no instruction. It was just like off the deep end. Um, and, uh, but I was just so passionate about, about this music and about the community. I mean, the thing, thing that struck me when I was in high school was the music, I, I, on a trip to England, uh, my senior year, we were supposed to be studying that summer at Oxford, but mostly we were just traveling around. Uh, I remember getting on the bus, I was the last one on the bus, and everybody was turned to the back of the bus, and there was a woman back there, from, her name was Meg from San Antonio, and she brought a guitar. And she was singing, and everybody was singing a lot. I, and I, that, in that moment, it was like, oh my God, this is what I want in my life. You know, and, um, and then I got, I got involved, and so um, I started as, as an agent, and I had, I had a book, I was working on a commission. I mean, it, it was a, being an agent is still a desperate little job. <laughs> um, but, you know, but I had, I, had, I had to book things, and you know, I was working with, uh, at that point, Stan Rogers and, and, um, and, and some other folks, and so I, I, I remember, I was so thrilled with Stan and his, his um, landmark recording uh, between the breaks. And I was so thrilled to represent him. And I remember I sent out 63 packages, you know, of press material and, and records to places, and mostly colleges. And, and I got one response. And I thought, this is kind of like not a good use of my time. <laughs> so I, I, I actually can't even remember how, but I started connecting with people who wanted to do concerts but didn't know how to do it. And, and um, I just started talking them through it. And I said, yeah. 
you know, to me, I'm glad I never had any training to, to do this because, you know, Asians have a, have a, a kind of a, 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 a bad reputation for some for good reason. And you know, I just always, you know, treating people like humans. I mean, to me, it was always, I mean, it's always, it's, it's like family, you know, and you treat people honestly and well and, and you, um, you know, establish a, a relationship with them, and that's how it ought to be. And it's got to be a, a traditional agent. Uh, agents, you know, it's kind of like get all the money you can right away, and if the venue goes out of business, uh, um, it's fine. You just move on. You know, I just wanted things for me had to be like a win-win. You know, the, the artist had to win, the venue had to win, and not lose money. I, I'm quickly just interject. I told us a little earlier, but I remember being at David's house once. And he was taking a phone call in the other room, and I was eavesdropping because that's what I do. And, uh, he, and I think uh, it might have been about Ani DeFranco or somebody you were representing. But I actually heard him tell the, the venue, "No, that's you're offering too much. You'll, you're going to lose money if we do that, and then you won't have her back next year." And I thought to myself, "If I ever had an agent, that's the kind of agent I would want to have because not every agent would do that. They wouldn't think long term." And so. Whether you had training to do that or not, you had this long-term philosophy. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I just didn't, again, maybe it's totally selfish that, you know, if, if, um, if the venue didn't lose money, then I might get another booking there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you, you, I mean, again, I said in, in this morning, I feel like I represent the venues as much or more than, than the artists. You know, that the most important thing to me is that the venues survive, that they, they make money, that, that, that they are there, or the artists are not going to have any place to work. And um, so that's what, that's what I did, and I had to train a lot of people to, to do venues so that I could, I could make tours for people. And um, I don't know what the rest of your question was. Well, so, so <laughs> you know, I sort of made that broad statement that so that really, in a way, carved out a circuit that didn't exist before. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you're just a link in the chain, and there are a lot of people, and a lot of people here doing the same, the same thing. You know, I, I, and uh, I just had, I just was uh, desperate to pay my rent, <laughs> and you know, and and, uh, and that's how it worked. And I was passionate about the people I worked with. The first person I signed, I was representing Stan, but the first person I signed was, well, was Greg Brown. After that, nobody knew Greg Brown at that point. He was a Fort Perry home companion, but I was passionate about what he did, and then I, I used that to leverage your booking with Claudia Schmidt. And Claudia Schmidt was the queen of the folk circuit at that, at that point, and, and, uh, um, you know, and I, was just, I was just so passionate about these artists that were making such a difference, and I, and, and I still am. I still am. And, and so, uh, you know, I just had to work hard to find games for them. Do you think it helped that you were also a musician and, and oh, understood yeah. some of that? Yes, I think, I think it has been such a great help that I... Because I go visit these venues and visit these communities and I have a whole different relationship with, um, with the promoters. In, in their audiences, and I know I know the roads, I know the sound systems, I know that you know, and and they, yes, I think that has made a uh, made a huge difference. Well, so let's um, let's talk a little bit about your life as a musician then, because you've done something that not too many of us can claim, which is you've held a group together for over forty years. That's 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 an accomplishment. How many have done that? Right? <laughs> Musters your feet. And now, it was always a duo, and now it's a trio, right? And so, talk a little bit about how that worked in your life. Talk a little bit about Musters. Well, again, you know, again, there's a, some desperation in there. All of us. Because when I became an agent, I wasn't making money, and I didn't make enough money to, uh, to survive on an agenting for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. So, Musters Retreat provided the, the extra income. I mean, it was, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't know that I ever wanted to be a performer. I was really shy, but I was so moved by, who, who, oh, Michael Smith said, you know, he, he learned songs early on, not because he wanted to be a performer, because, but he 
wanted to have them there whenever he needed them. You know, the songs that moved him. And I feel like, uh, you know, and I thought, oh man, that's, that's right. You know, because um, I, you know, I just, I, I, I played them because they moved me so much. And, and uh, I don't know, you know, friends pushed me into doing an open stage, and, and then um, <laughs> the arrogance of youth, it was uh, uh, <laughs> New Year's Eve 1974, and friends and I were at the old Heidelberg down in Ann Arbor, and there was somebody up on stage performing. <laughs> I thought, I can do better than that. <laughs> You well, I, I, you know, I went back and did an audition, and, and, and Libby Glover, who is here today, was, was the bartender there, and the owner said, you know, what do you think? And, and she loved what I was doing, and uh, so, I, you know, I, I, got, I got the job, and I wasn't very good. I wasn't better than the guy who was there, you know. So, so we very quickly had um, a, lot, a lot of success, you know, as, as the trio. We were, we were a trio, and uh, and then Libby left to go have a life around the country, and Michael and I continued. I, you know, I, there, there was just something there. It was the audiences. The audiences are what keep me going. You know, the, the fact that they they. Um, they seem to get something out of, out of what we do. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work. And then when you, you start having a job, being an agent, which is more than a full-time job, and you're just desperate for, for money, um, you know, you have to start rehearsing songs that when you were playing full-time, you never had to rehearse because you played them every night. Um, but I, I, again, you know, I, I, I wrote, people seem to get something out of it. And I never wanted to, to give it up. You know, I, I, I always thought the reason I became, one of the reasons I became an agent was we did folk music in, in songs that we loved and traditional music in the bars. And that's one of the reasons we were successful, because nobody else was doing that at that time. And, um, you know, and, and so it was a conflict for the bars, because we grew up, we'd bring in a lot of people, but they weren't heavy drinkers. You know, they, they drank folks and coffee. And, and um, so, when we transitioned to, you know, we, we always wanted to do concerts, we always wanted to play. We actually, our first gig was at, at the art, you know, at an open mic. And, uh, and, and they made the mistake of inviting us back. <laughs> and and uh, so, you know, when my, when my daughter was young, we played, you know, 15 to 20 shows a year. But, you know, we kept, kept at it. I think that's really important. To, to stay in, in the game. But one of the hardest things to do is to quit totally and then you come back and try to reestablish yourself. It, it's hard. And, and now, you know, we do 50 to 60 shows a year. You now she's grown up and, and makes more money than me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to say. So, because not everybody who's here was, was in your, your management workshop this morning, or, or the probably dozens you've done over the years for Folk Alliance. Um, do you have, have you boiled down sort of uh, your advice to, to people who are either seeking management or, or wondering if they're at that point of their career where it would be helpful to them? Well, there's an hour. <laughs> you know, so, it, you know, uh, I, I, I represented John Gorka, I think, from 1989 as a manager and booking agent. And I think John's, John's philosophy is kind of like, you know, the work. You know, you, you, you get, get good. I, mean, I, I don't know, people ask Tom Paxson, how do we have a career like yours? And he says, get good. That's Gorka, you know, he works on the songs and the playing and, and his audience. Those are, the, you know, the process is the most important to him. It's not, not the outcome, you know? And, and I think that's, you know, I would never tell anybody to try to travel my career path. You know, it's, it's, but that would assume a path. Right, right. <laughs> right, but, but, the, but the process, you know, being true to, to who you are and working hard, you know, like Utah Phillips said, this is a fine and noble craft. And, you know, we are craftspeople. And it's like, you know, you, you, 
this is all this is going to college, you know, and you you are learning this. You want to become a great craftsperson, and that you know. And then the, the side of it is the business. But I think you know, get good. You know, like Dylan's song. You know, know your song well before you start singing. I mean, that it's like, man, that you know, that's uh, that's it. And then and then, you know, I have been uh, I have been sort of trounced a couple times because I, I have been uh, been honest and trusting, and um, but I would I would not change that. You know, I. I I believe that I believe that's why I have the career I have and, and the friends I have because you know it is it is a cooperative thing you know we, we are you know I work with every venue that it, it's like you know the success of the venue the success of the venture you know that's where I, I feel you know involved in, in every one you know and and uh, and I think that people know it and I, I I genuinely am I genuinely care that your your venue. I, venue thrives and, and I talk to loads and loads and loads of people about that and, and the, the difficulties that, that they're having and um, you know it's because because I care and I think that's the you know for, for me that has been the, the um, way to go and for me it's the only way and that David Teddy Levitch is why we love you thank you yeah. Yeah. Just a few minutes, but if anybody would like to ask any questions of any particular Dave, uh, this would be a great time to do it. And uh, so, just if you want to raise your hand, ask the question. I'll repeat the question because I think this is being recorded. Is there anybody who wants to ask anything to any of these Daves? The gentleman in the front row. <laughs> this is not a question, but a testimony. I know two of these Daves very well as I've worked with them for 40 years. This is the reason why I am in the folk community. They represent everything that is right about this community. On my radio show, artists in two-way street are plugged every week. In fact, my program director made me sign a contract that says I won't have Pagola or Paola because he was cynical about how many times I have plugged certain venues. <laughs> um, working with David as an agent who understands each venue as an entity and not about the 15% or whatever it brings in. I have two agents where the artists want to play for us and the agent won't let them because we're too insignificant. David understands. These are people who are exceptional and make this community what it is. And I can't get down on my knees and praise them highly enough. <laughs> what they've done. Uh -huh. <laughs> You should be on the radio or something. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody else who would like to ask or say anything to these Daves up here? That's it? Thank you. Anybody else? You sure? Yep. I'd like to ask each of the gentlemen, who is your favorite Dave musician? Your favorite Dave musician? Musician <laughs> Dave. <laughs> That's going to be tough. Uh, Dave, we'll start with you. Do you have a favorite Dave musician? David Bromberg always had a special relationship to the art, didn't he? Probably David Bromberg, yeah. I just said Dave Van Romberg. Yeah. Dave Van Romberg was a lot of fun. Do yeah. you have a favorite Dave musician, David Barrett? <laughs> Dave Tanglebo. <laughs> Dave <Tim. laughs> he's, he's still, he's still a Dave Tanglebo. I, you know, this this guy is he, he is an exciting and entertaining performer, along with Michael Huffman. It's, now Libby. And and yeah, Libby, it's 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 just an outstanding show. And if you haven't seen it, see it. And I'm not just saying that because he's wearing a two-way street shirt. <laughs> it's because the pack he's chosen, he can't afford any clothes. <laughs> Yeah, he, he gave it to me. So thank you. <laughs> well, Dave, I don't think you can pick yourself. So do you have a, do you have a favorite Dave performer? I, I don't. My my, my long-term and short-term memory is gone. So. Uh, what? Is, I, 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 yeah. 
Yes, and then all that felt so genuine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then, you know, Dave Barrett um, produced uh, our, our our new CD, and it was a uh, it was a tr tremendous experience working working with him. And we've done them basically by ourselves, except for for once we worked with Barnett Rogers, and um, and he just uh, his expertise. I mean, he. He worked it in um, in Chicago for years at, at a studio, producing albums, producing commercials. Um, it, it was just, it was uh, eye opening and it changed the whole nature of our performing, as well as as a CD. So thank you. You know, the interesting thing to me is that um, whether you know it or not, sitting in the audience right now, that if you're involved in folk music in some way, it's because of some of the work that these four people have done. Thank you.